and thanks everyone for being here today. I hope uh, I hope you guys will all take away something from this presentation. And um, before we get started, uh, they asked me to provide a quote for kind of the presentation and immediately came to my mind a quote one of my mentors had taught me some years ago and that's there's no such thing as a magic foundation or peer system. Everything can be explained with soil mechanics and then can be verified in the field. So I want everyone to take that away from rigid inclusions. I know when I first started at GeoPeer, I'll admit that I was a little unsure about what a rigid inclusion was and how it worked and, and how to design for them. And I don't want you guys to feel that same way. Uh, so with that, um, the other thing that was interesting is you guys answered some questions. I appreciate that when you registered. And I was really interested to see kind of the breadth of folks who were interested in this material. We have obviously design engineers, contractors, architects, and developers. And then I was interested really in seeing kind of the overall distribution of people that were comfortable with rigid inclusions. There were some people that never recommended rigid inclusions in their reports. And there were some people that were pretty comfortable and, and they really knew when one was good over the other and, uh, and everybody in between. So hopefully everyone will move up a notch. Hopefully, uh, everyone will gain a little experience and even the folks who have never recommended original inclusion on a project will maybe find a way to work them in uh, to provide some good value for your owner. Uh, I'll sometimes refer on to the slides uh, as rigid inclusions with the abbreviation RI. That's just so we don't tie up the slides with uh, some long phrases. And then we'll also use the phrase rammed aggregate peers and abbreviate that as RAP, R-A-P. And wraps are our traditional ground improvement technologies. I think a lot of people, nearly almost everyone, are familiar with these days. So just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of those before we get started. So just a brief outline. We're going to talk about what is origin inclusion. We're going to go through when to consider origin inclusions. I'll then walk you through the geotechnical mechanics and design considerations you need to think about. And then we'll walk you through the options that GeoPeer provides. And then we'll do something I always like to end presentations on of to use or not to use. And, and we'll see if uh, you guys can come with these answers before I give them to you. So with that, we'll get started here. What are rigid inclusions? In a general sense, they're ground improvement that's much stiffer than the surrounding soil. And in order to get that stiffness, these elements are typically constructed of concrete or cemented materials, but not always. But they're generally much stiffer than the surrounding soil. And they're great when you have very soft soils and heavy loads. And the reason is, is they're able to transfer through softer marginal soil layers, those loads down to a more competent layer. And we'll talk about those mechanics a little bit in more detail. That's important to remember. Uh, ridge inclusions are also not connected to the footing. That's a big difference. Since they're not connected to a footing, they're not a deep foundation. And since there is no connection, they do require a gravel pad to facilitate the load transfer. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. And ridge inclusions may or may not have steel in them. And generally, in general, they don't. And that's just because steel is expensive and we like to figure out ways to keep prices as low as possible to provide that economic value for our clients. As I said, a ridge inclusion is not a deep foundation, and that's because it's not connected to the foundation system. That's important. But there are some similarities to deep foundations, and we'll talk about it. And as a result, we typically don't refer to a deep foundation as a pile. We refer to it as a pier or a rigid inclusion. And they're not magic. We really don't want you to think that these are some secret magic technology that you can never understand and or recommend. Really, these things are a strong basis in soil mechanics, and I think you'll see so after this presentation. So when should we use rigid inclusions? Well, before we talk about ground improvement, I think we gotta quickly walk through the traditional options for foundation support. If we have a good soil, we all know how to do this one. We're gonna support our building on shallow foundations. That's obvious. And if the foundation soils aren't so great, but they generally get better with depth, well, maybe we'll consider some type of undercut, replace the soil with engineered fill and support our building that way. 
We've all done that a million times. But at some point, those undercuts become cost prohibited, and we need to think about extending a foundation system through those bad soils and tap into the competent material below. And we all know we can use drilled shafts or driven piles or micro piles, all, all great choices oftentimes. And deep foundations are great. They provide excellent settlement control and they've been around for a long, long time. And so there's a lot of contractors and many of them local to provide good pricing for that. And since they've been around so long that most contractors have some type of piece of equipment or option to get to, to result in having no depth limitations, but they do have a cost. You typically require large pieces of equipment Deep foundations require pile caps and structural slabs. That stuff cannot be overlooked. Those systems are typically much more expensive than doing without. And they can often have slower installation speeds. And, you know, you see this with a drilled shaft where you may have to place a casing and protect the hole with a slurry. It adds a lot of time. And don't forget about that pile cap. You got to prepare that steel and it can just add time to the project. But in the early 1990s, GeoPeer really introduced and pioneered intermediate foundation systems. And at the time we were only using rammed aggregate piers. But over time, we developed new technologies. And by the mid 2000s, we came out with our first rigid inclusion project. And ground improvement in general, has significant advantage over those deep foundations. It's able to still provide that settlement control that the projects need. And it allows you to retain shallow foundation support of your structures. You do not have to convert your foundations to a pile cap or a structural slab. And oftentimes, as we're improving the existing soil, we can increase the bearing pressures beyond what the natural soils can accommodate. And since we're kind of designing each calm and building individually, we can really toggle the number of piers at each location to minimize difference, differential settlements between columns. So we have a lot of control over these systems. And what we found over the years is that using ground improvement often provides a 20 to 40% cost savings. That's why we care about it, right? We want to get the most economical foundation system to our owners, and we've seen that over time. And we created this little chart here I think it's kind of interesting. The further you get into the color, whether up or to the right, the more the savings by using ground improvement increase or decrease. So let me just give you an example. If you have a need, have a need for a 50 kip pile, driven pile, and you really need to go 80 feet to get that 50 kips, well, wraps or ground improvement are really going to provide a good cost savings for you. And conversely, if you're on, if you only have 20 feet to get to your bearing stratum and you can get 200 kips out of a pile that's 20 feet long then you're probably not going to see a good cost savings with rammed aggregate piers that's the facts but you can't forget outside the cost savings you can't forget that it's just they're they're quick to install because you install them before the foundation contractor gets on site and then the foundation contractor can install his shallow foundations like he normally would and that's a big benefit. You can't forget about that. So before you talk about rigid inclusions, I just want to make sure everybody was comfortable with rammed aggregate piers and kind of understand the differences here. We have a lot of rammed aggregate pier and rigid inclusion technologies. I think most people are familiar with the geo pier system. That's one of our first systems. It's on its third iteration. That's a drilled system. And if you have issues with keeping your holes open, you may have to move to a, an impact or ram pack system, which uses a displacement mandrel to create your uh, rammed aggregate pier. And we also have hybrid systems such as the X1, where you primarily use, you have to uh, drill out the soil before you install your pier, but it also has the ability to, to displace through limited depths of soil if there's a caving concern. So we have a lot of technologies. And the basics of a rammed aggregate pier is you excavate some soil, you get down to your design elevation, you place some gravel, you tamp it down, and then you return back to the ground surface with compacted lifts. And the tooling on this equipment 
I think almost everyone has seen it by now, is pretty straightforward. We have this beveled tamper and we have a shield on the top and the beveled tamper allows for good horizontal stress increase into the matrix soils and the shield prevents caving and it also provides confinement. So some soil can't kind of work its way being pushed to the side from the bottom of the anvil back on top of the anvil, if you will. So that's kind of our latest iteration of the Ram Dagger Gip here. And what do, what do we create? We create this really dense gravel pier. And you can see how tense it is. It's holding itself up, even though it's all the soils around it have been excavated. So we're really making something stiff here. As I said, it's really easy for the site, or the foundation contractor, to build those foundations when you use ram dagger gear piers. So you can see after you've installed your piers, you excavate down to the bottom of the footing and you expose the piers. You can do an additional quality control check and make sure you have the right number of piers. And then you'd want to tamp the top of those piers to make sure there's no disturbance from the excavation process. And then it's pretty simple. You just drop in your steel and you pour your concrete and you're good to go. And you've you just improved those soils in place and you didn't have any undercuts and everyone's happy. So that's Randagger your peers. And from here on out, we'll really try to focus on rigid inclusions. And when when do you want to consider rigid inclusion? That's really the question. But the answer is really it depends. It depends on the project and it depends on the soil characterization. So I think the best way to explain it is with a few examples. If you're in a swamp or low-lying wetlands condition, you may not be too surprised when this is your subsurface profile. And in this particular profile, we have a thick 30-foot organic stratum with SPTN values uh, we have our N60 on the left and the, uh, or sorry, the automatic camera value on the left and the, the corrected value on the right. And we can see we have blow counts anywhere from four to 12 blows. So some type of soft, medium, stiff, organic stratum. And underlying that stratum is a really good dense till. Wish it was at the ground surface, huh? Then we can use shallow foundations, but it's not. And so if we're considering to use ram aggregate piers here, we got to have we got to think about some things. So if we install a ram dagger gear pier into these organic materials, we're going to be concerned about the the compressibility of these materials. There's some four blow organic material here, and that organic material doesn't have the, a good ability to, or it's going to compress if you load it up too much. And if you compress these piers too much, you may get bulging, and bulging is really uncontrolled settlements. So we're a little worried about ram dagger appears in these thick organic stratums. And also, these organics can decay over time and we may have a loss of confinement on our pier. And if we lose confinement, we could have unsuitable settlements. So if we have those concerns and we have this really great bearing stratum below, it's probably better just to transfer the loads through those softer soils and take advantage of the good end bearing capacity in this dense till. We'll talk about those mechanics shortly, but that's the great thing about the ridge inclusion. It, instead of improving these organics in place, let's bypass them with a ridge inclusion that's much different than the surrounding soils and transfer those loads down to the till. In a similar situation in North Carolina, you may be used to the residual soils down there in the Piedmont. And what you'll find is you'll have silty sands and sandy silts and you have a varied weathering profile and typically the soils are weathered uh, in place and they're much typically more highly weathered than near the surface and they get better with depth as they get closer to the parent rock so you may have a profile that looks something like this and you get basically sandy silt silty sand 50 50 blends as i call them of residual soil and they can be loose i mean on this particular profile we have about 15 feet I guess my scale got cut off, but you have about 15 feet of weight to hammer silty sand. But underlying this weight to hammer and very loose material, you have some medium dense residual soil that gets better with depth. And so while you may not be concerned about long-term degradation since there's no organics on this particular profile, we're still worried about 
bulging into these soft materials, uh, particularly as our loads go up. So while we may be, over, be able to overcome the, those bulging by adding a lot of piers, it may become uneconomical to do so. It really depends on the loads. So in this case, again, we may want to consider as the loads go up to transfer those loads through these very loose sands down into the medium dense residual soils or better through skin friction and end bearing. And so just as I kind of just walk you through a couple examples, you can kind of see some patterns here. And there's really three considerations for when you want to consider ridge inclusion. And the first one is the loads. As the loads go up in general, ridge inclusions are starting to become more economical. But you also have to consider the, the subsurface soils. As those soils are getting softer and more compressible, ridge inclusions can become more economical. It may be their compressibility may have you have concerns about bulging or loss of confinement into those materials. And also, as your bearing stratum, you have this good material at depth as it becomes stiffer and shallower ridge inclusions can often become more economical. But what about moderate loads and moderately stiff sites? Well, sometimes you have to evaluate projects with both, rammed aggregate piers and ridge inclusions. And we just have to do that and estimate and price them out and determine which one's gonna be the better choice for the design team. So we're often considering both and you can consider both in your report. That was one of my questions I had for you on your questionnaire. But it's probably better just to call us and we can walk you through the, the various options on a site and give you that feedback via our internal pricing as to what option is the most economical. And that way you come to your owner with the best option as opposed to a basket of options. We're always happy to take that call. Okay. Some mechanics, this is a fun part, I really like this. So you can see in this diagram, we have a shallow foundation supported on some ridge inclusions. And as I said in my first slide, a ridge inclusion needs to have a gravel pad because it doesn't have a connection to the foundation. And then in this particular case, we have a very soft clay and high loads. And we just learned now, if you have those conditions, you may be worried about bulging into those softer soils and so you may want to transfer the loads down to a very dense bearing stratum, which we have. So the load, as you can see, gets transferred from the foundation to the gravel pad. The gravel pad then compresses. But where does it go? Once the load's in the gravel pad, it can only go through two ways. It can either go into the matrix soils below the foundation or it can go into the pier. And here, so, is it gonna go into this matrix soil? Well, let's look at the spring model that you've often heard on rammed aggregate piers. And the spring model that we explain to people is well understood and involves when you apply a rigid plate and you model the matrix soils as a soft spring and the rigid inclusion as a very stiff spring, and we know that the spring constants equal stress over strain and we set the flexions equal to each other we know that the rigid spring takes nearly all, if not all of the load, and very little load goes to the soft soles because of that stiffness contrast. And so I can sh I'll show you here shortly, we know that the load primarily nearly all goes into the rigid inclusion, that's important. And so now that we know the rigid inclusion is taking all this load because it's so much different than the surrounding soils, we have to resolve that load in statics. And the way we do that is what we're all used to is skin friction and end bearing. Nothing magic here. We all know how to do this. And so just to, not to bore some of the folks on this call, but we know that the capacity of our rigid inclusions is equal to the tip resistance and the skin friction. We can calculate the end bearing very easily by using the overburn stress times some factor. We can look those factors up in a table. We've all done that before. And similarly for skin friction, we know how to estimate that by in a granular material using some passive earth pressure coefficient times the vertical effective stress 
times uh, the uh, tan of the friction angle uh, between the concrete and, or the rigid inclusion in the soil. Uh, if it's cohesive soil, you may want to consider the alpha method, and then you use the alpha factor times the undrained shear strength of those cohesive soils. We all know how to do this. It's pretty straightforward. So there's no magic. This is what we do. The next thing we have to consider is settlement of rigid inclusion. And we've broken, broken the settlement into three parts, and they're listed here. We have Oops, sorry, I think I muted myself right there. Um, the, so as I was saying, once the load gets into the pier, we have to evaluate the compression of that pier. And then once the load makes its way out of the pier in skin friction and bearing, we have to calculate the compression of those lower zone materials. So you just add those things up and you get the total settlements of your foundation. Pretty straightforward. We're going to go through each one here quickly. The settlement of the pad, that's an easy one. That's just the stress applied to the pad times the thickness over the uh, modulus of elasticity. That's a really easy one. The upper zone, which is the pier area, the pier length, is really the movement of that area is solely the elastic compression of the pier from the load and the, rigid, the geotechnical set required to develop skin friction and end bearing. And where do we measure that? Does anyone remember where we measure the geotechnical set to develop skin friction and end bearing? Well, that's the load test. So we're gonna do a load test and we're gonna put some load on these piers and we're gonna measure how much they deflect. We'll put a telltale on the bottom of the pier and we'll measure the movement of the top and the bottom. We'll be able to say, see very easily that we're engaging end bearing and we'll be able to estimate this. The last part of the three settlement values that we add up to get the total settlements, the lower zone settlements. And this is pretty straightforward. We use our conventional geotechnical analyses to estimate these lower zone settlements. What does that mean? It means we take the foundation and we transfer that stress from that foundation down to the bearing stratum. We call that an equivalent footing. And that footing has a Boussinesque stress distribution or any type of stress distribution. And we then break the lower zone materials up into discrete layers we estimate the soil compressibility or consolidation parameters, and we calculate the settlement of each layer using traditional elastic or consolidation theory formulas. And there's a lot of ways to do this. There's no right or wrong way. I pulled up one reference uh, from Duncan and uh, from the Virginia Tech CGPR publication number two. And right here, we have four different ways to calculate those settlements. None of them are better than any other. There's just various ways to do this and it needs to be done. So we've really seen these three different settlement calculations, but they're all straightforward and we've all done them before. So there's nothing magic about that. So I hope you're all comfortable estimating the geotech capacity and the settlement for a deep foundation, pretty straight, for a rigid inclusion, sorry. Pretty straightforward. It's very similar to a deep foundation. In fact, it's identical. But the fact is that there's no connection to the footing and the loads are transferred through that gravel pad. It's important. We have a lot of options for rigid inclusions. We have the geoconcrete system, the grouted impact system, and the armor pack system, and more systems. And we'll go through these individually. So we got a lot of solutions for you, depending on your soil conditions. Kind of the simplest rigid inclusion we can make is if you recall, I, talked about the geopier system, and that involves drilling out a hole, placing aggregate in the hole, and tamping into place. And instead of placing just pure aggregate in that hole, we can mix in bags of cement into the aggregate, or order cement-treated aggregate. And that cement will hydrate under the natural moisture, and it'll harden up and become a uh, rigid inclusion because it'll be much, much stiffer than the surrounding soils. And it really changes the mechanics by adding that, that uh, cement. It no longer acts like a rammed aggregate pier because all that load would get attracted 
through arching through that gravel pad into the pier and then will be resolved through skin friction and end bearing. Your armor pack system. Armor pack system is pretty interesting. It's kind of a hybrid, I guess, between a ram dagger grip pier and the ridge and inclusion. And the armor pack system involves building a ram dagger grip pier inside an HDPE shell. And that shell comes in some fixed lengths, I think between 10 and 15 feet long. And we drive that shell into the ground and build a ram aggregate pier in the shell. And what that shell does is it prevents the aggregate from bulging into a soft or organic layer, like you can see here. That HEP really provides confinement. And so there's some limitations with the load you can put on this shell because it'll break if you load it up too much. But because there's a separation between the gravel and rammed gravel, rammed aggregate and the uh, matrix soils, it's not going to act quite like a rammed aggregate pier and it's going to end up transferring load to the tip. So you got to make sure these armor pack piers have some type of bearing strap to tag into. And the way we install them are if you have to, if there's a hard crust, you may pre drill the crust. You're going to take a displacement mandrel and push the HDPE shell into the ground. You can see that going on right here. Once you get to the design tip elevation and that tip is founded in some type of stiffer bearing material, you can then add aggregate to the top of this mandrel. The mandrel is a bottom feed mandrel, so when you place the aggregate in the hopper, it'll flow through the mandrel down to the tip, and we can create rammed aggregate strokes back to the ground surface. And here's a photo of the HDPE shell before we filled it. And actually we're really, we've withdrawn the manual, the mandrel for the purposes of this photo. Here's a photo of the mandrel in the pier. And then here's a photo of the uh, finished armor pack pier. I have a little video here that kind of explains this uh, graphically. So we drive the shell, HDPE shell, down to a stiffer bearing stratum. We're worried about these organics, and we don't want our rammed aggregate pier to bulge into them. We build a rammed aggregate pier back to the ground surface, and the aggregate is confined and won't lose its confinement because of the HDPE shell. And we end up with a rammed aggregate pier top above the shell, and that can be easily excavated and allow us to build shallow foundations like normal. So great when you have shallow organics. Grouted impacts. Grouted impacts are a versatile system we have. It's the impact pier is a rammed aggregate pier system, except we add grout to make it rigid and much different than the surrounding soils. So that this gives us the ability to transfer those loads through a softer surficial soil down to the bearing stratum because we've made a rigid pier. And because we're adding grout, and I'll show you the way we add it in a second, we can really turn the grout on or off. And that gives us the ability to say, grout up to the top of a layer we're worried about losing confinement in, such as an organic layer. And then we can continue finish the pier without grout and build a rammed aggregate stem. And this allows us to forego that gravel pad that's required to transfer the loads because we're building the gravel pad when we build the stem. And so it makes it really easy to construct. Here's a photo of what the bottom of the impact pier is for those who are not familiar. The we use chains inside the mandrel. These chains, when they're, the chains hang free, any materials allowed, whether it's aggregate or cement treated aggregate or grout and aggregate, is allowed to freely flow through the mandrel. And when the mandrel is compressed into the ground, these chains, as you can kind of see in this photo on the right, have a tend to bind up and really create a good compaction surface. So we don't need a plate at the bottom of these things. Unlike a GP3, we don't need a plate. We use these chains. They do. They they form two. They they uh, provide dual roles. They allow soil or material to flow through them, 
but they also wind up and have a good compaction surface. And so here's a, car a cartoon that shows how the mandrel or how the grouted impact pier is installed. We drive the mandrel down to the design tip. Remember, we want to we don't want loads to, uh, and bulging to occur in the organic stratum, so we're going to bypass through that organic into the dense sand below. We're going to first fill the mandrel full of grout, and then we're going to add our aggregate. The reason we do it this way is we want the aggregate to be well coated, and we want the voids in between the aggregate to be full of grout, so we build a very stiff pier. Then we start we raise the mandrel, and we that allows this grouted <clears throat> aggregate to flow out. We then lower the mandrel, and it creates a the the change. Uh, ball up and create a compaction surface and we're able to create these compacted bulbs all the way back to the ground surface. As we return back to the ground surface we maintain that grout level so that as we add aggregate the aggregate will always flow through the grout and so it'll be well coated. And then if we choose to and site conditions warrant it we can turn off the grout and finish with a rammed aggregate pier stem and again this is advantageous because you does not require a footing pad, the stem takes the place of that footing pad to transfer the loads. And it's much easier for the foundation contractor to build those shallow foundations. Got another little video to walk you through this. So we drive the mandrel down to the design tip. We're again concerned with bulging in this organic layer or soft clay stratum. We add grout, enough grout head. We drop aggregate through the grout so it's well coated and the voids are filled. And then we continue to create bulb strokes. And as we use up our grout and aggregate, we add more grout followed by aggregate so it's well coated and we return back to the ground surface with this process. And as we're installing, we're densifying the surrounding soils as well as densifying the aggregate. We return back to the ground surface, and if you so choose, you can turn off the grout and return with a rammed aggregate pier stem. Gives you a lot of flexibility with this system. So in addition to the impact mandrel that you need to build these grouted impact piers, we also need a, a grout pump and a space to store our cement material. And then you're gonna see some hoses crisscrossing the site, depending on the number of rigs, so we can pump that grout into the hopper and make sure we have a well-coated aggregate. One of my favorite case histories that really kind of drives home why rigid inclusions work, is the Assembly Square project in Somerville, Massachusetts. This project involved a you know, five-story building, but it had a parking garage, excuse me, and as a result, the column loads were pretty high, 1,000 to 2,000 kips. And we're right next to the river, and we have kind of a typical New England profile that has some type of sandy crust overlaying an organic material, soft organic material, with a sin thin sand stratum and stiff Boston blue clay below that. And sure enough, the footings were going to be placed right on top of this organic material. And so Randag appears wouldn't be a good option here because you could have bulging into the soft organic silts, the loads are high, and you may even lose some confinement over time due to the organics. So we're going to go grouted impact here. And this was one of the projects, one of our earlier projects, and we wanted to instrument this project to really make sure we understood the mechanics here. And so what we ended up doing was we put pressure pads at various spots on a full-scale load test. And so we put a pressure pad, we built a full-scale footing, we built a two-foot gravel pad, and we put a pressure pad in between there to measure the stress below the footing. And then we also put pressure pads on, pads on top of the grouted impact piers, and then we also put a pressure pad on the top of the matrix soils to measure the stress that goes to the top of the pier and the stress that goes to the soils. The only two places that load can go is the soils or the grouted impact pier. And then we put telltales 
and uh, instrumentation so we can measure the movement of the bottom of the pier, the top of the footing, and the top of the pier. And so I think we added a four group pier, a four uh, pier group, and we this is a photo of us pushing the putting the pressure plates on. You can see the highlight of the pier in orange here. A lot of wires to deal with. Um, here's a photo of us compacting that two foot gravel pad that's required to transfer the load from the footing to the piers. It's not so easy when you have all these telltales and, and uplift anchors in the way, but we're able to get it done. And we have a nice load frame and a four peer group to load test. So let's show you the pressure pad results first. This is pretty cool. So the pressure pad results are color coded. You can see on this chart, that's our schematic of our full scale load test. We have the pad that's in between the footing and the gravel pad. And you have the pad that's below the gravel pad but on top of the matrix holes and in brown. And then you have the light blue pads that are the pressures on top of the pier. And so the first thing we'll check is Great, we added load to the footing and we saw a response on top of the gravel pad. All right, but then we also now look at the load on the matrix soils, the pressure on the matrix soils. And as we increase the load, we can see that very, there's a very small change, if any, on those matrix soils. The load's not going to them. Let's look at this schematic down here. Let's recall the load goes to the foundation the foundation compresses the gravel pad. The loads are attracted to the pier through arching because the piers are so much stiffer than the surrounding material. And as a result, if you actually look at the stresses on a per, per pier basis, you can see how they greatly outpace the total stress added to the top of the footing. And that's because it's attracting all the load. Pretty sweet. I mean, this is it in a, in a, in a nutshell. We know the rigid inclusions attract all the load and the load's transferred into skin friction and end bearing. If we then look at the just the deflection of the various pieces of this full scale load test, we can glean some other interesting uh, points. Our design range, I think it was about 100, 125 kips per element. We had four, so we're somewhere in between this design range for design stresses, and we measured movement of the top of that footing in blue. And then we measured through a telltale, the movement of the bottom of the grouted impact pier in uh, reddish brown. And then in this green dotted line, we measured the movement of the top of the pier. Now, why in the world did the top of the footing move down more than the pier? How is that possible? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's the compression of that two foot gravel pad. So let's look at that movement. At the design load, that top of the pier only moved down about, call it a tenth of an inch, and the top of the footing moved down about 0.4 inches. So the difference between those two is about 0.3 inches, and that's the compression on the gravel pad. And so that's, so we know the load's going to the piers. We know the compression of the gravel pad is not that high. And we know that the total settlement of that footing is less than a half inch at the design stress. So kind of our takeaways here, the gravel pads needed to transfer the load to the piers. We know that that load was transferred almost entirely to the pier and not to the soil through arching. And we saw from this graph that the grouted impact pier takes a lot of load with little movement, about 0.4 inches for that group. That's great. Geoconcrete columns. Geoconcrete columns is the last technology we'll talk about today. And like a lot of our rigid inclusion piers requires a large rig in order to extend the mandrel down to the design tip elevation. The rig has uh, some crowd pressure, but it also has a hammer on top, which gives it some vibration energy to penetrate denser stratums below if we need to. Some other pieces of equipment you may see on site when we're using geoconcrete columns is a concrete pump, whether a big one or a small mo uh, mobile pump. 
And what we end up doing is we pump concrete through a hollow mandrel with chains, similar to the impact pier, and we pump that concrete down through the top. Uh, here's kind of a zoomed in picture on that mandrel. The mandrel sizes generally range from 12 to 18 inches. And similarly, with the, like the impact piers, we have these chain restrictors that when they're loose, material such as concrete or aggregate is allowed to flow freely through it. But when we lower the mandrel, the chains bind up and create a good compaction surface. And so this mandrel allows us to create a bottom bulb that's larger than the mandrel diameter, but it allows us also to return to the ground surface with the, di with the diameter of concrete equal to the mandrel diameter through displacement. So we're not, end up, we're not spending a lot of extra concrete on making bulb strokes back to the ground surface, so you get a very fast installation. And so the installation process is detailed here on this picture. It involves placing a pile of concrete or stone first. We want to get a little bit of a plug on the mandrel so the existing soil doesn't move up into the mandrel and, and contaminate the concrete. But then we drive the mandrel down to the design tip elevation while pumping concrete. And then we raise, once we get to the design tip elevation, we raise and redrive the mandrel multiple times to create a base, just like we do with our other systems. But we're primarily relying on end bearing with this system because we're making a nice bulb. And we don't want to spend a lot of money or time on creating bulbs to the surface, though we could. And so we simply extract the mandrel while extruding concrete back to the ground surface. So this system ends up is really fast and it results in a good end, a good end bearing capacity. And the system is pretty flexible. You can install it above an excavation, like you see in this picture, or you can, if the subgrade conditions are really soft, you can throw out an aggregate pad or mats. And one thing that's important is we need to maintain the grout, just like or the concrete, just like some other. Um, foundation systems we really need to create a keep a good head of concrete when we're extruding the mandrel and the reason is, is you don't want to create a discontinuity in your pier that's important so you got to go slow enough and extrude the concrete with a good head so you don't create a discontinuity and have an issue when it's loaded so how do we know we're building a bottom bulb and not just squishing concrete back up into the mandrel well, the reason we know that we're not, we're, we know we're actually putting concrete where we think we are is because we can measure the volumes of the, these things. We measure the volume of the concrete that we put in the mandrel on the way down using a calibrated pump. But we also know the total volume of that mandrel. And if we know the volume of concrete we put in, we know the volume of air remaining in that mandrel. We can add them up. And if we use the relationship PIVNERT, for those who may have forgotten this from their physics class in college, we know there's a relationship between volume and, and pressure. And so we can calibrate the mandrel and therefore know, based on the volume in that mandrel, what the air pressure may be. And so as we're extruding concrete, we can tell how much concrete we've released at a given location. And also as we return the mandrel back to the ground surface after creating our bottom bulb, we can observe the air pressure gauge that we've instrumented this system with and make sure that the pressure stays high enough that we don't have a discontinuity, that we have a, we have a suitable head of concrete. So we have a really good idea of what we've built. That's important. I have a little video here that kind of shows the installation. I think this is pretty important to kind of tie it all together. You can see we have a mass rig. We use a displacement mandrel. We're going to displace soil to the design tip elevation. And we're worried about bulging or loss of confinement in our soft clay or organic layer. We're going to build our bottom bulbs, measuring the air pressure to, when we know how much concrete we've released, and we return to grade while maintaining air pressure so that we don't have a discontinuity in the pier. Pretty cool.
So some rigid inclusion conclusions. There's no such thing as a magic peer. And we know that, and we know from that pressure plate load test that the load is attracted to the very stiff peer, not the soil. And we know through statics that the, the load in the peers resolve through skin friction and end bearing. But we require a gravel pad since there's no footing connection. And we have to account for the settlement of that pad. And what, this calculation of the settlement and the geotech capacities is very easy to do. We do that for deep foundations and all sorts of deep foundation systems on a daily basis. And we know since we're not transferring load into those surficial materials, that we can really take the load through them and apply it to a more competent layer below. That's what makes rich inclusion so great. So a couple examples, see if you guys have caught on and kind of understand some of these concepts we've been talking about. I want you guys to think if this is a good rigid inclusion job. So I have this job in New England that involves a dense sandy fill crust, but we have some soft organic soils. And we have a pretty heavily loaded building, a seven story on grade commercial structure with loads of about 700 kips. And so we're looking at these organics and we're like, ah, oh, gosh, way to hammer, two blows. They took some Shelby tubes, ran some consoles. It's pretty compressible. I'm worried about putting too much load on those piers, bulging into those soft soils, or maybe even the long term degradation, degradation of those soils. So I look below those soils and I see a really good dense sand and gravel layer and maybe even bedrock down here. And so instead of improving those organics, I wanna just bypass through them with a rigid inclusion and transfer the load to that really good sand and gravel bearing material. Good rigid inclusion job, yes, absolutely. I got another job in Maryland that involved a five-story medical office building with some modest column loads, 350 kips. In this particular geology, I'm in the coastal plain. I have some engineered fill that didn't have compaction records. I have sandy uh, clay sands, loose clay sands, underlain by stiff to medium stiff clays. And so what are we gonna do here? Am I gonna extend a rigid inclusion through these sands and tag these clays? Uh, Maybe not so much. Not sure how much capacity I can get. And why would I go through the, all these sands? They're not that bad. And the loads aren't that high. But I think it's better just to improve these alluvial deposits with ram aggregate piers. I think that's the right solution for this 350 kit building. And that's what we ended up doing. Bridge inclusions just don't make sense here. Soils aren't that bad. All right, here's an interesting project because it's only a two-story warehouse. I think this one's in uh, in Toronto, Canada. And we have this cohesive fill layer that's, you know, loose, maybe a medium stiff pocket or two up here, underlain by a stiff clay. And on below that clay, actually stiff, but also some soft pockets in it. And that's underlain by a really good gravel till. So, or sand and gravel till. And so do we really just want to go straight and tag that dense sand for these 250 loads? I don't know. It seems awfully deep. We're going 20 feet down to get to these materials when the loads aren't that high and these soils aren't that compressible. We got a couple low blow counts over here, but all in all, they're mainly stiff clays. And then you may also consider a rigid inclusion a shorter one that may be more economical but less geotech capacity because instead of going into the dense sand medium dense sands below you're tagging these stiff clays and going into those so that that may be okay let's price that one out but it also may be a good job for ram dagger your peers because your fill isn't that bad and you have stiff generally stiff clays below with a few soft spots and so you can really see you almost like almost can run three separate analyses to kind of come to your answer. Probably with these loads being as light as 250 kips, we probably won't even 
consider this one, this deeper one. Well, we may consider the short GCC or even the Randaggy appear. All right, ready for this last one. So we have this granular soil profile and a really heavy building. And you can see the blow counts are medium dense sands, seven loose to medium dense sands. Some sands have some silt in them. And we have a really good end bearing stratum. And we have really high loads. But you know what? The sand isn't so bad. I can make a really dense pier with a rammed aggregate pier because I can densify these sands so well. I can get really good capacity in these sands. But you really got to look at the notes on your boring logs. We read these things that geotechs, these notes that they put on the logs very carefully. And this particular site had some interesting words on their log. You can see here that I uh, blew up for you. Voids noted eight to 10 feet below ground surface. Tree wood, metal cans, and rubbish. I think this is the first time I saw rubbish in a soil classification. But because of these materials being noted within the fill material, it really gave us some concern about the long-term degradation of those uh, organics and rubbish. And so on this particular job, instead of with ram, using ram dagger piers, we elected to go through the fill that had some questions, questionable material and getting good end bearing capacity on the dense sands below. So as you can see through those four examples, it's not always obvious when to use ridge inclusion. But I think you guys have a little bit better idea now. And you can incorporate some of these thoughts on your next project. And most importantly, if you're not sure, give us a call. We have local design associates. You can call any of the area managers that work for GOP here, and we'll be happy to walk through your project and help you get the best solution for your project. So thanks for attending.